Hello, I'm Lynn Bondurant. Welcome to our fifth program in our series, 25 Years of Progress. During this fifth episode, we cover a few events from 1964, and we'll see quite a bit of film from 1965 and 1966. In those years, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration continues to work on the goal of landing a man on the moon before the end of the decade and returning him safely to Earth. In pursuit of that goal, NASA continues to prepare for the two-man Gemini Earth orbital space flights. General purpose of the flights is to ready men and technology for later flights to the moon. One major objective is to be able to rendezvous and dock two flying spacecraft. Flight crew people prepare for Gemini rendezvous and docking missions. They use a docking simulator to develop docking techniques. Scientists use the data for Apollo as well as Gemini. NASA researchers use other devices to meet unusual needs. Here's an air bearing beta trainer. Beta stands for Balanced Extravehicular Training Aircraft. Scientists intend to use it for studying the problems of movement and tool handling in free space. It eliminates many of the frictional forces experienced on Earth. There are two nearly frictionless air bearing surfaces. Researchers demonstrate a lunar landing research vehicle at NASA's Flight Research Center Edwards Air Force Base, California. Gross takeoff weight, including the pilot, is about 3,700 pounds. This is the first of two such craft. Scientists design it to fly and simulate lunar landing, takeoff, and control, and astronauts use it for training. Workers progress towards completion in early 1965 checkout of the first space vehicle transporter. The four tracks are installed. Each track link weighs a ton. The transporter is to weigh five and a half million pounds. And in 1964, development of a probe is underway which is to soft land on the moon to survey the surface before men are to fly there. More lunar reconnaissance is needed before a manned landing is to be tried. Much information is to be gathered by unmanned surveyor spacecraft. Surveyor is the responsibility of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Scientists test surveyor systems. Engineers plan for flight testing before the end of 1965. The surveyor is to land on the moon, analyze its surface and environment, and radio findings to Earth. Now let's go to 1965. In 1965, NASA gains much experience with manned Earth orbital space flight during the Gemini missions. The Gemini space vehicle is man rated during the 19-minute Gemini 2 unmanned test flight, which takes place in January. And Gemini 3 is the first Gemini manned flight. Grissom and Young fly three orbits. During Gemini, 
The first American spacewalk occurs in 1965. By December, Gemini 7 provides the clincher with two weeks in orbit. The medical news is encouraging. Results of the flight show no long-term harmful effects on astronauts Borman and Lovell due to weightlessness. That means missions to the moon are medically feasible and NASA does a wide variety of other aerospace work in 1965. Space Highlights, 1965, an eventful year in space. These pictures telecast live from the moon were recorded by the Ranger 9 spacecraft just before it slammed into the lunar surface. This was the final mission in the Ranger series, a series which gave us a close-up look at the moon and clues to its character. Another picture-taking highlight, Mariner 4's voyage to Mars, a 325 million mile journey that returned the first pictures and data ever gathered close to the mysterious red planet. There were two Tyros weather satellites placed in orbit, Tyros 9 and Tyros 10. Between them, they spotted five hurricanes and 14 typhoons. Their television eyes transmitted thousands of photographs of the entire Earth to aid weather forecasters. Early Bird 1, the world's first commercial communication satellite, was launched by NASA for the Communications Satellite Corporation. Early Bird provides telephone, telegraph, high-speed data, and television between Europe and the United States. One of the 14 scientific satellites launched was an orbiting solar observatory, OSO-2. OSO's instruments provided information on the seething hot gases surrounding the sun and how its tremendous energy controls events on Earth and other planets. More than 400 sounding rockets were launched during 1965. Sounding rockets vertically probed the region between the limits of balloon flights and the lowest orbital satellites. NASA conducted many of these launches in cooperation with 16 countries. In aeronautical research, the X-15 rocket airplane soared to the fringes of space more than 30 times. New instrumentation was installed in the XB-70 2,000 mile an hour airplane. These studies are helping to design this country's supersonic transport. Also tested were vertical takeoff and landing planes, which may someday revolutionize air travel. Saturn I. The first generation in a series of rockets which will ultimately place men on the moon completed three successful launchings. Here, being static fired, are the engines which will actually lift the Saturn moon rocket off the launch pad. The Apollo spacecraft also underwent rigorous testing. Paving the way for the flights to the moon, astronauts Virgil Grissom and John Young proved Gemini ready for longer and more complicated missions with their three orbits of the Earth. Next, our first long-duration mission, the four days of Gemini 4 with James McDivitt and Edward White piloting. The highlight, of course, was White's 22-minute walk in space. Gordon Cooper and Charles Conrad demonstrated that an eight-day lunar mission is feasible. They spent eight days in orbit in the Gemini 5 spacecraft. After an Agena rocket failure, Gemini 6 was reprogrammed into a combined mission with Gemini 7 for the final manned space flights of the year. Astronauts Frank Borman and James Lovell left first in Gemini 7. Theirs was a long duration mission, 14 days in space, one meaningful to future manned flights. Plenty of time to complete a host of medical and scientific experiments.
Eleven days after their departure, Walter Schirra and Tom Stafford boarded the Gemini 6 spacecraft and headed for a rendezvous with Gemini 7, a rendezvous in which the four space pilots circled the world in formation. Gemini, Ranger, Mariner, Tyros, Orbiting Solar Observatory. These and many more made 1965 a year of significant progress in this country's peaceful exploration of space. Let's move to 1966. To put 1966 into historical focus, that is the year that Marcel de Rutter lives five days with a partial artificial heart in his chest, but dies of a lung rupture in Houston, Texas. Jiminy again is a highlight in 1966 for NASA. NASA officials show the ability to meet unexpected difficulties successfully. The Gemini 6 spacecraft is poised on the launch pad ready to blast off and rendezvous with an Agena target vehicle. The Agena does not orbit. So workers remove Gemini 6 from the pad and they launch Gemini 7 on December 4th. Gemini 6 is ready again about a week later. Gemini 6 launch rockets burn four seconds and shut down. Astronaut Walter Schirra is ready to eject but does not need to do so. Three days later, on December 15th, NASA successfully launches Gemini 6. The two orbiting Gemini craft with men aboard make a good rendezvous in space. Much other NASA activity takes place in 1966. Nineteen sixty six, a year in which aeronautics and space achievements were much in the news, achievements which are expanding man's knowledge. Here is a report on some of those accomplishments. This animation shows how Surveyor One looked as it came in for a soft landing on the moon. The date, June second. As evidenced by these photos, a spacecraft can land on the lunar surface, and probably a man can walk on it. Some of the terrain is very similar to our soil. A man would leave footprints as he would in sand. Many rocks dot the moonscape. Future flights will photograph other possible manned landing areas and carry instruments to measure surface hardness, information needed before men land there. Charting actual landing sites for the astronauts is the job of Lunar Orbiter. Two of the 850-pound satellites have orbited the moon, photographing and mapping wide areas, sometimes sweeping as low as 25 miles above the surface. Here are some of the pictures, pictures helping to determine the height and slope of lunar mountains and the depth of craters. These remarkable views show the crater Copernicus. Pictures, too, of the backside of the moon. And a view of Earth from 240,000 miles in space. The Surveyor Lunar Orbiter combination has returned valuable scientific data about the moon, helping pave the way for the first lunar explorers. American weather satellites are a good example of technological potential put to work not only for our own well-being, but that of other nations. The high-flying picture takers have given advance warnings on everything from hurricanes in the Gulf of Mexico to great sandstorms in North Africa and Arabia. Three satellites making up the Tyros operational system were launched for the Weather Bureau in 1966 and are returning daily meteorological information around the world. Nimbus, an advanced NASA research weather satellite, was also launched. Nimbus took both day and infrared nighttime pictures over the United States and of the entire Earth, predecessor to long-range weather forecasting systems. One of more than a dozen scientific satellites launched by NASA in 1966 was orbiting Geophysical Observatory. Nicknamed OGO, it studies space phenomena such as radiation belts, 
solar plasma, magnetic fields, their effects on each other and the Earth. Another satellite is greatly refining our map-making ability. Appearing as a bright new star, it is called Pagios. Pagios carries no instruments. By reflecting sunlight from its 100-foot shiny surface, it provides an orbiting point source of light. Serving as a beacon in the sky, the satellite is simultaneously photographed by widely separated ground stations throughout the world. With the help of Pagios and using the principles of geometry, the Earth's surface can now be mapped with greatly increased accuracy. Two Pioneer spacecraft were launched into orbit around the Sun, Pioneers 6 and 7. Between now and 1970, an entire series of these Sun Watchers will be put into orbit around the Sun, investigating, reporting. Future Pioneers will venture even closer to the Sun, observing the solar atmosphere close up and warning of solar storms, sending back useful data about the Sun-Earth relationship. More than 300 sounding rockets were launched from various locations around the world. These small rockets play an important role as they scientifically probe the atmosphere and ionosphere, testing out equipment and experiments to be flown on future satellites, and helping us better understand weather and communications. Sounding rockets, so reliable and flexible they can be launched during sub-zero weather, or from on board a ship at sea to take measurements during a solar eclipse. Total eclipses happen only once every two years. November 12, 1966 was the date of one of these occurrences. The place? South America. Certain celestial phenomena can be recorded only when a total eclipse blots out the sun's direct light. 300 scientists from the U.S. and other countries, complete with equipment, gathered in South America to witness and record the event. Some flew on high-speed jets which intercepted the moon's shadow and then raced along with it out over the Atlantic. Others used sounding rockets to record changes in winds and temperatures and make X-ray measurements. As the moon's shadow swept from coast to coast across South America, Scientists had an opportunity to acquire a history of a complete solar event in a cooperative international program. This is the hypersonic research vehicle, X-15, a rocket, airplane, and spacecraft in one. In the atmosphere, it flies like an airplane. At the edge of space, it is controlled by Gemini-type reaction jets. On November 18th, the X-15 rocketed to a world record speed for winged aircraft, 4,159 miles per hour. The sleek black plane has also reached altitudes of more than 67 miles. But the X-15 is more than all this. It is a flying research laboratory making contributions that range from bioastronautics to future leadership in high-speed, high-altitude, supersonic, and hypersonic flight. There may be a need someday to shuttle men and equipment between orbiting space stations and Earth. It is for this reason that NASA has been studying lifting bodies. This prototype, called the M2F2, is one of the lifting bodies currently undergoing tests. Wingless lifting bodies are being developed to operate in space, then return through the Earth's atmosphere, landing like a conventional airplane. Research continued in developing systems that might power future space missions, yet undefined. Present-day rockets are, for the most part, liquid fuel. Now under study are solid propellant rockets of equal or greater thrust. The Florida Everglades was the site of the second test firing of a powerful solid fuel rocket motor. The eight-story tall motor spewed out a pillar of white-hot flame from its exhaust nozzle. The so-called large solid burned 840 tons of rubber-like fuel at a rate of six tons per second.
Also in the research stage, nuclear propulsion engines. A series of tests are being jointly conducted by NASA and the Atomic Energy Commission. The rocket would use a nuclear reactor to produce thrust. Small, less fuel-consuming nuclear engines being tested now may someday enable scientists to plan long missions to distant points in space and carry greater payloads. Project Gemini, this country's second manned venture into space, falls between the experimental Mercury program of the early 60s and operational Apollo flights. We've gained much experience from Gemini, nearly 2,000 man hours in space. Experience which has direct application to the Apollo program. There were five Gemini flights during the year, rounding out a series of 12, 10 manned, two unmanned. Gemini operated in a building block fashion. Experience learned from one mission was applied to the next. This included both the successes and failures. Gemini's major requirements, rendezvous and docking, long duration missions, learning to work in space, and the ability to bring a spacecraft down to Earth close to a desired landing point. By the end of 1965, we had satisfied the long duration mission requirement. During March 1966, Gemini 8 astronauts Armstrong and Scott carried out the first rendezvous and docking with an orbiting Agena, but all did not go well. A malfunction caused the spacecraft to roll erratically. The crew was forced to undock and make an early landing in the Pacific, proving the ability to evolve alternate plans, to learn from the unexpected. Gemini 9 had a double problem. The Agena could not be put into orbit, and as you can see here, the shroud surrounding a substitute target did not come completely off. Even so, Stafford and Cernan rendezvoused three separate times with what they called the Angry Alligator, and Cernan spent more than one orbit outside the spacecraft. Then Gemini 10, when astronauts Young and Collins met with and latched onto an orbiting Agena. The docked craft then powered up to rendezvous with the Agena vehicle left in space from the Gemini 8 mission. In addition, Mike Collins became the third American to practice extravehicular activity, although trouble with his oxygen system shortened the spacewalk. Gemini 11 was also a successful flight. A new altitude record of 860 miles was established with the docked Gemini Agena combination. As in the two previous missions, EVA was cut short, this time because of fatigue. But Gemini 12 showed how man could work more productively outside his spaceship. Astronaut Edwin Aldrin, using special handholds, tethers, and foot restraints to counteract the effects of weightlessness, spent more than five hours outside the craft, completing all his EVA tasks. A 100-foot line was attached between Agena and Gemini, conserving valuable fuel, and even creating a small amount of artificial gravity. During all the Gemini missions, many important scientific and engineering experiments were carried out, and hundreds of photographs like these are giving us a better understanding of our Earth. Of special significance, too, has been the ability gained to control a spacecraft during the all-important re-entry, an ability which has allowed Gemini to land within full view of the recovery forces. Gemini has prepared us well for all future manned missions into space. Nineteen sixty six was a year of development and testing for Apollo Saturn. Escape systems, fuel cells, spacecraft, all the major components are being worked up to a state of readiness. Three uprated Saturn I rockets were sent aloft from Cape Kennedy to check out the performance of the launch vehicle and unmanned spacecraft. All went well, including recovery in the South Atlantic. This, a prelude to manned Apollo missions. At the Kennedy Space Center, a full-scale engineering model of Apollo and the Saturn V rocket 
were put together inside the newly built vehicle assembly building. From there, a giant crawler transported the rocket and craft to the launch pad three miles away. 1966, a year of exploration and investigation. Whether building toward faster, more efficient planes of the future, developing space hardware at industrial plants throughout the United States, or performing basic research at university and government laboratories, 1966 was a year of progress in both aeronautics and this country's continuing peaceful exploration of space. Those are the 1966 NASA highlights. Please join us next time for our episode six of our story of 25 years of NASA progress. During the next show, we will cover the years 1967 and 1968. I'm Lynn Bondurant.